Thank you very much, Mrs. Green, for singing. And if you have your Bibles, open to uh, the book of 2 Timothy tonight. The book of 2 Timothy, if you would please. Thanks again for being here Wednesday night as we come back into our normal midweek services. Now, you may remember that when, uh, when we were down for a little bit in the month of March, right before that, we were going through a series on alcohol and the Christian. All right, we're talking about the place of alcohol in the Bible and how that affects a Christian and if it affects a Christian and what part that plays. I took a brief hiatus, all right, that would be six months, uh, brief hiatus, um, because I wanted to make sure, I, I wanted to communicate this lesson particularly face-to-face -face instead of solely online and, and on live stream. Now, I know many people are still on live stream with us, and that's wonderful. I'm not hiding what I'm saying, and I'm happy to post everything that I say on YouTube, and uh, that's where it posted before. I did this series on music. It is all on YouTube. I think all seven lessons on that. If you have not listened to that, I would encourage you, not because I'm a great speaker, but, but because I try to bring the truth from God's Word. And so tonight, though, as we come back into this series, I'm going to review a little bit. All right, so don't get discouraged. Uh, I'm not worried that you'll remember anything I say. I don't think you remembered what I said on Sunday. All right, so if it sounds like Sunday, it is. No, I'm going to review where we left off a little bit just to kind of catch us up uh, so we can really hit the ground running. Also bring people up to speed who maybe were not part of those series before and where we sit. And it's why we do what we do. Why do we live the way we live? We call ourselves Christians. We claim that this is God's Word, inspired Word of God. Do we not claim that? Do we not encourage and exhort and challenge uh, those to read this Word every single day? And you ought to read God's Word every single day. If you can't read it, listen to it. If you can't read it or listen to it, have someone else get it in you. But you got to get it inside you every single day. And you ought to spend time with God every single day. It's not so much about a time. I spent time with my wife yesterday from 8.05 to 8.07 a.m. She got two whole minutes. Check that off the list. If that was my attitude, I ought to go to the couple's retreat. Yet that's how we treat our relationship with God, is it not? There it is. Lord, I checked it off. I spent time with you. On to my next day. It's not about just checking a box. It's about spending time with our Savior. Our Redeemer, the one who gives us the grace, enables us. So as we kind of just lay the groundwork, get back in, look at 2 Timothy, if you would. Chapter 2, verse number 15. A challenge from the Apostle Paul to Timothy, his son in the faith. But it is much broader in context and application than just to Timothy. Of course, on these Wednesday nights, I'll do my best to teach appropriately and really jump into what God's Word says. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, kind of our foundation for this whole series, these whole topics, the Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God. A couple thoughts in that first phrase, there's the idea of study. Now the young people are back in school. When the teachers say study for your test, they know what that means. That means that outside of the classroom or outside of teaching time, they act, actually glance at the material with the hope to learn it and to retain it and understand it. Study. Right? If I said, listen, Johnny, study your spelling words. And he says, absolutely, Dad, I read them yesterday. Oh, that's it, Johnny, you got it. No problem. Why is your test labeled with an E, which doesn't mean excellent. I thought you studied. No, Dad, I read it. I did read it. But what does the verse say? Study. It's not just a casual handling of the Word of God. It is not just a cursory glance at the Word of God. Here, Paul is instructing Timothy, and in the broader application, us as Christians, through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, that we are to study to show thyself approved, and I love the next two words. What are they? I'm supposed to study to show myself approved. Next two words. Unto God. Unto who? God. Unto God. Does that mean that I'm most concerned about the Baptist church down the street, what they think of me? That's not what it says. How about what the folks on Twitter 
or Facebook or Instagram may say about me. Is that what it says? No, sir, no, ma'am. It says, study to show thyself approved unto whom? Unto God. That's who I'm trying to please with this. That's who I'm trying, if I can, to impress. You say, well, can you impress God? Well, God takes notice of his servants. He surely did it with Job. He brought up Job to Satan. Hast thou considered my servant Job? He said, look at Job. Let me draw your attention to this servant. My Bible says, for the eyes of the Lord run true and fro, to and fro, throughout the whole earth. To show himself strong on the behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. Like he's looking, and he's looking for those servants, his saints, who would impress him. There are times in the New Testament where Jesus is said to have marveled at someone, a human. Always in relation to their faith. Not because of some great work, but he said Jesus marveled at their faith. One time he said, I have not seen, I think it's so great faith in Israel. I'm supposed to approve and be approved unto God if I can to impress God. Or can I say it this way? I'm trying to take God's test approved unto God. I'm looking to check off what he wants me to check off. You say, oh, well, God doesn't have any expectations on us. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. He says, you can take my yoke upon you. There's still something to do. But he said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light compared to over here. But God still has expectations on you and on me. Do not fall into the trap that God does not care what we do. You better believe he absolutely cares what we do. And he gave us his word to guide us. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. He wants to direct our paths, but, but, but don't miss, he has expectations. And there is a movement out there that says that God has no expectations. You can just live like you want to live. And whatever you think, your thoughts are powerful, your thoughts are elevated, and no one should disagree with you. Your thoughts are good. Then I turned a little unfamiliar passage in Jeremiah. Where God says, for the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? He answers that question in the next verse. It's not a rhetorical question. He says, I, the Lord. He goes, I know your heart. Study shall thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. I think that word ashamed is referring to a twofold shame or twofold shame. I believe there is a shame that we will face when we face the Lord if we fail to study to show thyself approved unto God. If we live life our own path as Christians, we will be ashamed at His coming. That's the one shame. There's another level, I believe, of that shame, and that is in an earthly here and now sense. You ever been challenged by either a, another Christian or an unsafe person about one of your beliefs? Have you ever, in that situation, stumbled to find an answer because ultimately you really didn't know why you do what you do? You ever been there before? Well, why do you do this? Why don't you drink alcohol? Well, and then all of a sudden you're making up verses. You're attaching two or three to together. All right, you're twisting them, you know, three ways past Sunday. They look like a, like a biblical pretzel with a little bit of salt on there. And you kind of shut down the conversation and walk away. There's a certain level of shame when you're confronted about what you claim to believe and you really don't know why you believe what you believe. That's part of the shame here. We ought to study to show ourselves approved unto God so that we know why we believe what we believe. Now I try to teach you and preach from God's Word. But you ought to know from God's Word what you believe. If you don't, all right, don't stop doing it just get in God's Word. All right, get in God's Word and find out 
rightly dividing, the last phrase there, rightly dividing the word of truth. When we handle God's word, I want to handle it sincerely and honestly. I gave this illustration last time. You'll remember as I started, but I was in the service a long time ago. The man said, open your Bibles to Revelation chapter. The last chapter, he goes, go to the last chapter of your Bible, Revelation chapter 22, and read verse 21. He read the verse, Revelation 22, 21. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. He then proceeded to say, everyone knows that the last thing someone says is the most important thing. Begin to illustrate that as a parent, when you're leaving the house, the last thing you say is the most important thing you mean to your children. And so the very last verse in the Bible is probably the most important verse in the Bible. Anyone have a slight problem with that statement? Not a little familiar verse? All Scripture, all Scripture, help me here, all Scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable. But he said that that's the most important verse. He then went to preach a message on grace. And it says the word grace in that verse. Now, it was a good message on grace. It would be what's considered a topical message, different passages. Different, that's what we're kind of doing in these sessions, kind of tap, a topical. Didn't have a problem with what he said about grace. I had a problem where he started in rightly dividing the word of truth, making sure that we're saying what it says, that we're not trying to twist it just to fit what we may think it says or what we may want it to say. All right, because if you want to, you can twist the Bible. You can take that little verse, go thou and do likewise, and just swing it all over the place to your detriment and to the detriment of, of the folks around you. You can take other verses that are maybe a little clearer than that and twist them and, 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 and just, and, and in the process, hinder and hurt the cause of Christ. So as we look at this series of topics and messages, we're bouncing and kind of using 2 Timothy 2.15 as a foundation. I hope through this you'll take some notes. All right? As, even, not, maybe not as we review tonight, but take notes. And go home. And go home and look at God's Word. And if you think I'm wrong, call me. I'll talk with you. Absolutely will. I have been wrong before. Ten years ago or so, it was a warm... No, no, no. I, I take very seriously preaching the Word of God. But as a human, I'm not going to say everything correctly. You know that. I'm going to mix up names sometimes. I've done that in church. You know that, right. Mix up ages and dates, right? We'll do that. But I take very seriously God's Word and my responsibility to study it and preach it accurately. There's not much in the world that will irk me more than someone who twists the Word of God. So I'm trying to bring it correctly and appropriately. You may not like what I say, but I hope you know me well enough now that I'll support, I do my best to support what I say from the Word of God and support it with other passages. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the Word of God... It's right here. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Your heart will be discerned by God's Word. Your heart needs to be discerned. My heart needs to be discerned by God's Word. If I discern it by what's around me, I will come up with false conclusions. I will come up with conclusions that say, well, you know what? My reaction is perfectly acceptable because of the situation rather than what the Bible discerns my reaction is supposed to be. So we look at this, let's pray and ask God's help as we kind of review tonight. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your word. Lord, I ask you to help us as we look at your word and look at some of these ideas and concepts that you would guide us, your spirit would lead us into all truth that it would speak of your son Jesus who is the truth and illuminate and clarify the scripture so that our hearts will be challenged or corrected, that our thoughts would be strengthened or struck down and our actions would be pleasing to you. Lord, bless this time in Jesus' name I ask, amen. I hope that you will study the word of God and study it hard, study it well. Be the best student of the Word of God. You can write in your Bible or not. I've written in Bibles. Sometimes I write on paper. Some people mark their Bibles up all over the place. 
In college, they had these special pens you could buy that would not leak from page to page. A ballpoint pen will often leak from page to page. Very helpful. But I hope you study. I hope you take notes. And I hope you become a student of the Word of God. That'll keep you. That'll keep you in the way. The Word of God. We're going to look at a couple things that we kind of review tonight. I want you to remember our three words that we used as we go through this series. And the first word you remember is what we have called a principle. It will be on the screen. A principle is a Bible truth that I must live by. A principle is non-negotiable. A principle is not up for debate. It's not up for question. Here's a principle from God's Word. Those who believe Christ will go to heaven. Right? Those who don't will not. Whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or not, whether you think, well, I learned at my church this, it doesn't matter. That is a principle from the Word of God. It makes sense? Does not change whether you like it or not. A principle will always be true. And you and I will always prove it to be true. Whether by living it and reaping the blessing or ignoring it and having the consequence. You will always prove and I will always prove a principle to be true. Psalm 119 verse 4. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Of course Psalm 119 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I love Psalm 119 where every verse is directed about the word of God. Precepts, treasures, um, uh, the, 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 the word, and you can go through that, the truths from the word. You see, our problem is not typically a knowing problem, it's a doing problem. The Bible speaks in many principles. How do we respond to unkindness from someone else? The Bible tells us very plainly, does it not? If I have someone who does not like me, an enemy, the Bible says I am to love them, to do good to them. I don't want to, I don't care. The principle is, this is what you're supposed to do. You understand that? A principle is a Bible truth that I must live by. It's not always convenient. It's not always easy. But it ought to be inflexible in your life. I must live by it. How do I interact with my husband or my wife? The Bible tells me how to. The Bible tells me, as a husband, to love my wife. Bible command, right? Bible principle. Is it not? And then it tells me to the level which I love her, and that is as Christ loved the church. In case I missed it, says, and gave himself for it. He says, that's the bar. He says to wives, to submit, to be in subjection to your own husbands. Don't get mad at me. I didn't make the rules. All right? Sorry. I'm sorry, man. You have to love your wife. Well, pastor, you don't live with her. You're right, I don't. That's another Bible principle I'm not supposed to. (laughs) All right? But beyond that, I don't want to. All right, I got my own. Pastor, you don't know what it's like. You're right. But God does. He makes the rules. Bible principle. Pastor, you don't know how unreasonable my husband is. I can imagine. I've got a tremendous idea in my mind, but I didn't make the rules. The Bible tells us how to respond to parents. They're right here. Parents, you say amen right now. The Bible tells us how to. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. Children, of which you are such, obey your parents. How? In the Lord. For this is right. Where are my kids? They're right here. Good, I'll get them too. I had to slide over for a second. What does obedience look like? Quickly or immediately with a right attitude. Obedience is not stopping your feet, slamming a door, and still doing it. All right? You ought to be ashamed of yourself, some of you, some of you too. Ashamed of yourself. That's not obedience. It's not obedience. It's not up for debate. All right? Sometimes I'll ask one of my children to do something. And they'll say, with, with all the angst, and they're about to, they want to have a response. But I don't want a response. I usually know their response. Not because I'm smart, but I'm smarter than my kids. At least today. (laughs) Parents, you know what I'm talking about. You can see what's coming. You see the the turmoil, right, Brother Terry, on their face. (laughs) It's a struggle. 
The struggle is real. The Bible says obey. The Bible says obey. Parents, on your end, that should be your expectation. Parents, if you're not expecting that, you're also disobeying a Bible principle. You're allowing your kids to ignore God, and you're standing idly by. Shame on you. Shame on you. Bible principle. I could stay there for a few minutes, but I digress. I hear that, Brother Mark. You want me to stay there for a few minutes? You, <laughs> you let me know which one. We'll go after him. No, I'm just kidding. Bible tells me, Bible principle, how to work for an unreasonable, unsaved boss. Bible talks about that. And if you think you have it bad in the Bible when it talks about this, it's referring to a slave and his unreasonable master. I don't care how bad you have it, you don't have it that bad. You don't. The Bible tells how to respond in that situation. A Bible principle, a truth that I must live by. Pastor, I can't take it. I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. Be careful. Only so many pieces. And you'll be out. But be careful and all, without joking aside, be careful because your testimony and obedience to God is a lot more important than your reaction. Right. Bible principle, a truth that I must live by. Should I be honest? Should I be honest on my income tax return? Should I be honest on my income tax return? See, kids, I'll get your parents now, right, for a moment. Yeah, the Bible says yes. Absolutely. Honesty, integrity, the Bible talks about that. You can look it up. Well, no one will know. <laughs> Welcome to K5. Don't forget, Jesus is watching you. And you're right, no one on the side of this, no one on this side of heaven may find out. You're exactly right. IRS may, may never come knocking down your door, but there's the owner of the universe, who, the creator of the universe, who owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He's taken tally. He knows. He knows. A Bible principle, a truth. Does God care what I do outside of church? Yes. Yes, he does. The Bible talks about our conversation. That's our lifestyle, not how we talk. And the conversation is not in regard to church. There's some very clear teachings for church. We know that God cares at church. When you come to church, you're probably not going to use bad language at church. You would think that God would care about that. Probably not going to be swearing in the house of God. Even unsafe people know that. Oh, I'm in church, sorry. Right? But God cares about that outside of the church walls too. Because He's with us all the time. And in case you're wondering, read 1 Corinthians 6. Your body, my body, is a temple of the Holy Ghost. He absolutely cares. Principle is a Bible truth. There are commands. There's the thou shalt, thou shalt not in principles. Those are the easy ones. All right? Should I kill my annoying neighbor? That's the easy one. Thou shalt not kill, right? That's the easy one. There's the teachings. That's a Bible principle. Jesus in John chapter 15, abide in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. That's a teaching, all right? But it's a Bible principle. He goes on to explain what that looks like. That, it means it's non-negotiable. I must live that way. If I abide in Jesus Christ, He will cause me to be fruitful. If I don't, I will spiritually wither away and die. It will happen either way. I will prove that principle correct, either by adhering to it and reaping the blessings, or ignoring it and reaping the consequences. If I abide in Jesus, I will have blessing. If I don't, I will wither spiritually. It's a Bible principle. It's true. And there's examples of principles positive and negative in the Bible. Samson. Samson ruled by his flesh. Had a problem with women. Pretty much his whole adult life. Bible principle. Example. Joseph ruled by his relationship. How can I sin against God? You see, I want to be ruled by my relationship with God, a Bible principle. 
Now understand with examples, I cannot take an arbitrary example or an example and arbitrary apply it to my life. For instance, one time in Scripture, the disciples are there, they're supposed to pay, pay taxes, and, and, uh, or they, they ask Jesus to pay taxes, and Jesus says, well, we will, we'll, we'll render this way. He says, Peter, go fishing. And the fish that Peter catches is a coin in the mouth, right? Goes and pays the taxes that, that he owes. All right, example of what Christ can do, example for us as we obey the authority God has placed over us in the government realm, exactly. But I can't arbitrarily apply that and say, listen, you know what? I need to pay my consumer's bill, so I'm going to go fishing. There's a bass. Hey, I got a quarter. Right? It was an example, not a method to make money in my life. I can't arbitrarily grab examples from Scripture. I have to apply them in context. That's the end of 2 Timothy, rightly dividing the word of truth. Right? Not just arbitrarily grabbing concepts. So that's a principle. You got that? Help me here. What's a principle? Is a Bible truth that I must live by. Got that okay? Shake him around. You got that? Good. Second one word is this. A conviction. A conviction. Conviction is a personal belief from the Holy Spirit based on a principle. Not based upon history. Not based upon tradition. Not based upon another church. Not based upon my next door neighbor. Based upon a principle. A principle being, of course, a Bible truth that I must live by. Galatians 5.16 says this, This I say then, walk in the Spirit. You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Romans 8.5 says this, For they that are after the flesh, that is an earthly sense, do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, referring to the Holy Spirit, the things of the Spirit. What, what Paul tells us in Romans is that there is a earthly mindset, a fleshly mindset, a method that makes sense on a carnal or earthly level, and there's a mindset that is operated on a spiritual realm in relationship to the Holy Spirit. And they are not the same. This is not the same as this. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of of God, for they are foolishness unto him. I'll pause there real quick. That's why you will never be understood in the public sector. They are foolishness. What you believe under the Spirit of God is considered to an unsafe person foolishness. Foolishness. You are crazy. You believe what? About what? Wow. How, how do you even operate? It's foolishness. Don't be surprised. Neither can he know them because, the verse says, they are spiritually discerned. That means the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, brings discernment in my life and brings discernment in your life. Jesus says it this way in John chapter 16, verse 13. How be it, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come... He will guide you, speaking to the disciples and to us collectively, into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself. The Holy Spirit does not talk about himself. So Jesus says. It says, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He's called the Spirit of truth and will guide us into all truth. May I remind you of John chapter 14, verse 6, where Jesus says... I am the way, the truth. Jesus is the truth. Whom does the Spirit speak of? Jesus. He speaks of Jesus. Whatever he hears, that he speaks. And he will guide us. So a conviction is a personal belief from the Holy Spirit based upon a principle. Let me try to explain this. All right, now let's get kind of back. I'll explain what this means. It means that the Holy Spirit will direct you as you read God's Word in ways that you ought to live based upon the Word of God. All right, not talking about principles here. There's a principle, but then further than that. He will not say you ought to kill your annoying neighbor. He will not contradict the Word of God. He cannot do that. I read an article a few years back. There was a gospel singer, a lady gospel singer, a Christian music singer, who was divorcing her husband. 
And in the article, I read the quote myself, where she quoted and said, the Holy Spirit told me to divorce him. I don't know what she heard in her head, but I know who, what she did not hear, and that was the Holy Spirit. Right? He will not contradict the Word of God. Convictions, according to the definition, and I believe this to be true, are often personal. Personal. They're a conviction that God has worked in my heart, my life about. For instance, I've shared this a few times. Years ago, I was here a youth pastor. I had preached at Community Baptist in Saginaw, their Christian school. That afternoon or so, the, later on that day, I was at the mall, Fashion Square Mall. Back when it was still open and still had stores in it. So you know it was a long, long time ago. I was at the mall. All of a sudden, I heard these words, Pastor J.D., Pastor J.D., and all of a sudden, I was surrounded by a whole group of the young people from Community Baptist, good young people there that I preached at in chapel earlier that day. And they were excited to see me, saying hi, you know, what I was doing. Of course, I was shopping, blah, blah, blah. Remember as I stood there, I looked down at myself, and I was wearing just, just ratty clothes. I was wearing a pair of jeans, a t-shirt, and it looked, looked just like a, just like, at that time, I looked like a deadbeat. I'm not saying that is a deadbeat, that's what I look like. And the Holy Spirit touched my heart that day. All right, there is a principle in Scripture that I'm an ambassador for God, an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Right? Can't change that. I represent Him. I am a light on a hill. Can't change that. That's a principle, right? But like it or not, it's what happens. Holy Spirit touched my heart and said, J.D., you deadbeat. He said, no, something like that. Why are you dressed so, so ratty? And that day I said, you know what? When I go out in public because of what God has called me to do, I'm going to try to dress up a little bit when I go out in public. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and say, God says that you better dress up when you go in public. You ought to dress when you go in public. All right, that's from God's word. All right. Don't go out naked or half naked. You laugh, but we just got out of summertime. See? You didn't know that was coming, did you? <laughs> You ought to dress up when you, you ought to dress when you get out of the house. But for me, so you know what? This is what I need to do. That's a conviction from the Holy Spirit. I knew that God was speaking to me. You're like, are you sure that's the Holy Spirit? We know when the Holy Spirit is talking to us. You've been in a service before. I've been in a service. And you've been under deep conviction. What does it feel like? I'll tell you what it feels like sometimes. Sometimes it feels like a knot in the pit of your stomach. Sometimes it feels like sweaty palms. Sometimes, right, teenagers, you know this, right? You know, and you're, you're there, you're shaking. Some people shake, oh, not every service, but you know what I'm talking about when the Holy Spirit's talking to you and saying, you need to get this right. You don't think, boy, I wonder why I think this right now. You don't think that. Maybe you resist. Go back to Sunday afternoon to service. Teens were praying, many adults prayed. There's no doubt in my mind, though, the Lord was touching other people to come pray. And that some people said no. And you knew, under conviction of the Holy Spirit, that you ought to pray. I'm not saying He works. I don't know. I'm not the Holy Spirit. But I think you know what I'm talking about. You know the Holy Spirit. And that day, I knew it was the Holy Spirit talking to me. And said, you're deadbeat. So, I made a conviction. That's what I will do. You say, well, Brother Howell, will you ever wear jeans out in public? Yes, I will. I had a motorcycle a long time ago, rest in peace. I almost always rode my motorcycle in jeans in case I fell off. Tried in a suit, but it's tough in a suit, isn't it, Eric? Yeah, not nearly as fun in a suit. Understand in this that in a conviction, that what may be right for you in a conviction may not be right for somebody else. To him that knoweth the good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now, these are not the Bible principles. Those are non-negotiable. But inside of this, in the conviction, there is some personal touch from the Holy Spirit. Let me give you some examples of that. Beards. Right? Right? For years, that was a big, big deal in fundamentalism. You, I mean, you could not have a beard and be right with God. Now, I'm not saying they should not be right for some people in the conviction of the Holy Spirit. No problem. I'm not arguing against it. I'm not, I'm not poo-pooing them. I'm not teasing. I'm just saying, you know the concept. You would be hard-pressed, if not impossible, and I would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anyone who said that beards are sinful from the Word of God. I could take you to one place that's Jesus. 
All right, where they plucked his beard out. Now, you may not like my beard. That's okay. My wife likes it, and that's all I care about, besides the Lord. And if you don't like it, I'm sure you'll tell me. You have no problem doing that. But for some people, that was sin for some, so don't, so don't do it. For others, a while back, it was wire rim glasses. Wire rim glasses, people would rail against this and preach against wire rim glasses. Now, I don't have a problem with someone saying, you know what, we should stay away from that. Perhaps it's a new fad or something new. We often do this in the school, right? Something new will come in. We're like, you know what, I'm just not comfortable with this, so we're going to steer away from this. But that's a conviction, not necessarily a Bible principle. Screens in church. You want to hear some heated, heated sermons, listen to ones on screens in church. People will exalt the hymnal to the level, if not above, the Word of God. I mean, they're preaching on screens in church when they never preached about the Word of God that way. It's shameful. And we got five of them on the main floor. Heaven help us. We're in trouble. Now, once again, don't miss my point. I am not, I am not faulting those who do not have a screen in church or believe that that's not right in church. That's okay. I'm okay with that. But understand, the Bible says nothing about screens in church. Know that when microphones first hit the circuit, they didn't want microphones either. When pianos hit the circuit, a whole, whole section of churches said, no instruments. You have instruments in church except the human voice. You are displeasing God. Praise God we have instruments. I don't want to hear all of you. It masks many of you that ought to be masked. I'm just saying that a conviction is something that comes from the Holy Spirit. And I hope and I pray that you've been directed by the Holy Spirit. What many Christians will do will take what the church says, not think about it, not study, and never go beyond that and ask the Holy Spirit, they just go back from it. Well, you say that, that's good for you. You're the pastor. You're the pastor's kids. You're on staff. I don't see what's wrong with it, so I'm going to do this. No, no involvement of the Holy Spirit or God's Word. You ought to be directed by the Holy Spirit. The things that will be corporate, things will be individual. But it all must be covered in grace. The problem arises when we think everything is just a personal conviction. Everything is not just personal conviction. It comes off like this. Well, I don't feel convicted about such and such. Remember Bible principle? It doesn't matter if you feel convicted about it or not. It still is true. You still can't do it. But as, as Christians, if we're not careful, we fall into the, I've got to feel convicted or it's not wrong. If I don't feel convicted, then I'm not going to change. Some people say, well, I don't feel convicted about living with someone else I'm not married to. It doesn't matter. It's still wicked. It's still wrong, according to the Word of God. It's wrong to live with someone the opposite gender you're not married to. I'm not convicted about my ungodly music. It doesn't matter, but if you're not thinking on these things, Philippians chapter number 4, verses 8 and 9, it's wrong. It's wrong. We were asked by people outside the church why Doreen went back to teach in a public sector. He said, well, Pastor, you've got that tremendous Christian school right here. Why doesn't she teach at BBA or outside the church? Still the principal. And I said, well, reason number one, I'm principal, she's teacher. This is not going to work well, okay, for number one. But that was just in jest, of course. I said, the real reason is because as we sought the face of God, we believed it to be God's will for her to do this and have an impact in this way. It is not the path for everyone. Obviously. You see where my kids go to school, Bridgeport Baptist Academy. I believe in Christian education. I'll give you just one point about that on the side, why I think it's important. I was talking with somebody today, and we're laughing about this. My kids have often come home and spouted the truth of the teacher into my face. Years ago it was James in a present. Dad, you can open this present. Mrs. Allen says you can right before Christmas. 
everyone knows you can't open presents till Christmas. All right, that is a that's a principle from God's word. I'm, I'm pretty sure. All right, I'll find it. I'll study it out. I'll find it. All right, you can't open it till. He said, no, Mrs. Allen said you can't. I said, no, James. Uh, no, James, you can't. Um, we're not going to open it yet. Daddy, you can open it. Mrs. Allen said you can open it. I said, James, I- I'm not going to open it. Dad, she says you can't. I said, listen, I'm Mrs. Allen's boss, and I've just overruled Mrs. Allen as her boss. I had to pull out the administrator boss card so we could put this present aside. Now, funny, right? Kids do that, though. They pick up on their teachers. Your parents have experienced this before. Well, so-and-so said this, so-and-so said this. I want my kids under the influence of godly people. So when they mimic that and they model that and they hear that instruction, um, Jesus says that how can, a, how can a servant not be like his master, disciple not be like his master? I want them in a Christian environment, hearing God's word and Christians leading them. I will put our, our school staff against any other staff. They are tremendous. Our teachers, assistant pastors, tremendous. Not perfect, but tremendous. But we believed that God had called Doreen to have an impact and be salt and light in the public sector. And some people did not like that. Some people said, you know, Brother Howell, outside the church, I think that's a wrong decision. I think it's a bad decision. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Some people said, well, you're probably just doing it for the money. There was a misconception about that out there. I won't take the time. But if you know me, if you think that I live my life because of money, then you don't know me. Now I'll spend it. So will you. So don't look at me. We all spend it. All right, whatever you want to spend it. Maybe you might say, but we, we, all, we all do something with it. But if you think I live my life just because of money, then you don't know me. All right? We did that because of a conviction of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's not right for everybody, obviously. But we believe that's right for us. That's a conviction. And I am out of time tonight. It's already 8.04. I didn't get through all the words. I'll have to pick up there next week. But the challenge for this, of course, is you look at God's Word. All right? You study God's Word. Listen to the Spirit of God. Let Him move and work in your life. Lord, I thank You for loving us. I thank You for this time. I hope it was a help. Lord, I hope we're challenged again by how we ought to live as Christians. Lord, we're not called just to walk through this path like we want to, but you've called us to something special and unique in your plan. Lord, guide us and direct us. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.